Okay, so first we're going to just discuss the mechanical um, design of the system. So obviously the mechanical system is uh, responsible for supporting the paintball gun mechanically and um, generating or managing all the forces that are involved with the paintball gun. So um, this involves basically two things. It means supporting the gun while rotating it and supporting the gun while angularly accelerating it. So if we just look at the angular acceleration part first, um, this obviously comes from our uh, requirement specs, which I don't have in front of me now. I'm going to add it uh, halfway through the video. So this requirement spec obviously required us to accelerate the gun at some um, specified angular acceleration based on the maximum speed that can be achieved by, by a human accelerating. Virus protection is out of date. Yep has been for a few months. So, um, because we're going to angularly accelerate the gun, this implies we're going to impart some torque on it, right? And it also means that we're going to pump energy uh, into the gun. We're going to take energy from, from some source and then convert it to uh, kinetic energy and that's going to be uh, what accelerates the gun. Well, the acceleration is, the, is putting energy is the process of putting energy into the gun to accelerate it. So you get two things out of this uh, angular acceleration thing. You get the power required to accelerate the gun at the required rate and you get the required torque. So when you're specking a motor, torque isn't enough. Like you can, you can get torque from anything. It's about how much power can the motor pump into your system. Uh, and uh, a lot of motors are actually extremely powerful but they spin very very fast so you have to gear them down if you're going to need a lot of torque out of them um, so these two requirements the kinetic energy and the torque then you can start specking motors pretty well and as another frame of reference just imagine things around you that use the same kind of motors and uh, that use them well so uh, I think in our case uh, a, a hand drill seems to be a pretty, pretty good uh, approximation of the kinds of weights and torques that we're working with so looking at those motors and, and looking at data sheets from those motors to get a feel for uh, the kinds of torques and powers that they can give off um, is a good start. So uh, obviously the torque on the gun, kinetic energy into the gun, those gives us some frame specs, you know, how stiff should the frame be to be able to manage these uh, forces and uh, motor specs from the kinetic energy into the gun. So then from the torque of the gu that the gun required and the energy input into the gun, you can figure out the kind of torque requirements for the motor and with that also a gear ratio. And this is going to take some iterative design obviously because uh, um, you don't want to choose a motor that spins at 50 billion RPM but you have to gear it down 50 billion times to reach the uh, required torque that you need. And with the gear ratio and the torque from the motor, you have some you have some drivetrain specs. You can, you can then choose uh, gears or belts or um, Pulleys, no, pulleys and belts go together. Worm gears, what else is there? I don't know, slew drives. Yeah, but we're going to go with belts, and I'll explain that in a bit. Uh, in a, in a bit when we get to that point. If we go up to the rotating the gun part, so this is not taking into account the acceleration. This is just what does it take to rotate the thing? Obviously there's going to be some angular limit, so that has to go 30 degrees up, 30 down, and I think 70 pan. Um, then you have to choose bearings, you have to figure out what kind of centrifugal forces are there going to be on this rotating system, so if your weights are offset, then what kind of forces are going to be generated when this thing starts spinning? If your gun is leaning forward and you spin the system up, is it going to jump off the table or uh, fling itself out of its brackets? So um, um, that gives you some more frame specs for how to design it. And uh, also we have to design the gun to do all this while it fires. So it's, uh, it could be all nice and well if you design your system that it all rotates around the center of gravity of the gun and everything is, uh, there's almost no forces except for the torques and it's beautiful design and then as soon as it fires it jumps off the hinges or you know uh, cracks a shaft or something like it has to be able to to handle the firing forces and all of this is going to take a bunch of calculations which uh, I'm not going to show completely in this video but there are, it's a lot of calculations just to iterate through how this thing should actually look but the kicker is that all of these things have to be done while you keep into account 
that it has to maintain the accuracy requirements that we specified. Because you can design something that's extremely robust and flexible and it can take all the forces in the world, uh, you know, it fires and it sort of wangles out of the way and then wobbles back into place and it survived, but that's not very accurate. You, know, you, you need something that's stiff enough to get that, uh, I think, what was, what was it, 0 0.45 degrees accuracy uh, to achieve your um, hit to miss ratio that we want. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically what it takes to design the mechanical system and then obviously the details into that. Um, We'll discuss that as we go. Okay, so designing the mechanical system for our paintball gun. It's going to be an iterative process, so you're going to start rough, decide on some concept designs, uh, you know, what will be easier to manufacture, what stuff you can get a hold of, um, play around in your mind with, with what can handle the torques that you think should be needed. Then you have to do some initial concept designs yeah you know think about how you're going to build the structure how it's going to hold the gun i'm going to show a few here so you can have a one tower with a gun attached very easy to build uh, rotate the tower rotate the gun on the tower um, obviously drawbacks of this is you have this one plank and it's going to be very um, easy to twist that plank you know if you're going to start chasing someone around uh, that plank is going to maybe have an unwanted resonance frequency or something like that um, Pivot with swivel base. You know you can have a linear actuator or something. Just pivot the pivot the gun at the back and then lift it up and down like this. There's some advantages disadvantages to that. Now uh, torsion tube yoke. This is ideally what you want to go for when you build some sort of turret thing like this because um, I don't know what to call it. Uh, if you have a tube and you and you try and twist a tube, the shear forces flow all around the tube and they counter that very very well as soon as you make a slit in the tube and you try and twist it then you'll see that the two edges of the tube move away and the shear forces can't be countered I think it loses like 70 it's 70 times less stiff so when you want to try and keep the gun uh, say we have two towers like this and you um, put the gun in the middle of the towers and it starts twisting it around those towers are going to start flexing like this and this bottom bar has to take a lot of torsion uh, when you when it starts doing that so ideally you want that bottom bar to be a a, a tube which is the most ideal thing to take torsion uh, you know if you if you transferring the torque between those two towers you want it to be a tube but these are very difficult to manufacture and um, I don't think we we need it to be that strong but that's a good way to go if you're going to commercialize this thing. So um, the final choice is just two towers, a wide base to make sure it doesn't flex, and then maybe some support to um, try and transfer so it doesn't all go into torsion that you sort of lift up the other side. I mean, you can, if you just imagine how the structure is going to deflect in your mind, then you can sort of imagine where you should put reinforcements and stuff. So this is the design we're going to go with. Then the paintball gun. Uh, we don't need a very fancy paintball gun here, we just need the cheapest one we could find. And the cheapest one that I could find uh, here in Cape Town was the Griffin FX. Um, I think if I had the money, ideally I would have gone for a electronic trigger, because then I could just wire a, a, um, I could just wire a MOSFET up to whatever current it needs to trigger the paintball gun, and I don't have to worry about adding a servo to pull the trigger and stuff like that. Um, but this is a cheap and easy one. If you've chosen some rough concept design, then you do some inertia and torque calculations and that enables you to choose your first round of um, motors and drivetrains. So choose a uh, the kind of motor that you need. Um, like we discussed, we have our power requirements and we have our inertia, uh, our torque requirements. So you can spec your first motor. So that motor is obviously going to start adding weight to your concept design. So recalculate the torques and inertia with the motor added and then choose another motor and then eventually, I mean just do it for like two, two maybe three times, you'll get to, uh, you'll converge to the ideal uh, spec motor to frame to gun ratio um, and then you can start making more fine design choices, uh, you know, cheaper motor or 
uh, DC versus brushless. We're going to go with DC. There's no way we're going to design this thing to work with a brushless motor, even though they have more torque for the same weight ratio. We're not building an, a turret for aircraft. It's going to sit on the ground, so it could be it, it can be a little bit heavier. Uh, you know, as long as it has the torque to whip the gun around uh, like we wanted it to. Um, so I'm going to skip some ranting explanations here. And uh, I'm just going to say we're going to build a custom servo mechanism to to power the system. Um, usually paintball guns you see online use uh, model aircraft servos that have been geared down. Um, but they're neither accurate enough for our purposes. I think model aircraft servos only are accurate about 1.6 degrees. And like we said, we needed 0 0.45 degrees. Okay, granted, if you step them down, then they gain accuracy, but they lose a lot of speed. The other thing is that control systems are designed um, to match the inertia requirements of the system they're driving. And uh, the PID loops inside these servers are tuned to drive ailerons and elevators of aircraft, not, uh, you know, swivel paintball guns around at Usain Bolt speeds. So we're going to design our own server mechanism. Okay, steppers. We're not using steppers because they're very, very good for getting stuff to a point precisely and with a lot of torque, but not a lot of speed. Stepper motors lose their given torque exponentially as they speed up. And given that you already lose torque when you do micro stepping, because you know st stepper motors only have like a 1.6 degree accuracy to them so if you micro step you can get cl you can go down from that but you lose torque because um you know the stepper motor either holds onto this coil and then it steps and holds onto that coil so if you micro step then you sort of uh linearly interpolate between the coils and it sort of uh, the the rotor lies in between the two coils somewhere and you lose a lot of torque like that and when they when the stepper motor starts spinning up, just like look at this graph, it loses almost all of its torque. Um, and we're going to have to spin the thing fast if we geared it down, which just, it's its not a good um, choice for a very dynamic control environment. You want to use servos. I'm a very big fan of server mechanisms. Steppers are great for 3D printers and CNC machines, but not for turrets. Okay, so here you can see on this graph that our DC powered servo mechanism will basically hold its torque indefinitely uh, throughout its entire uh, velocity range. Only at the end does it start dropping off. Okay, and we'll also use belt drives because they have no backlash um, and printing custom diameter uh, pulleys for the belts. It's much easier than finding custom gears online and also a lot cheaper. Um, so gears, backlash is when gears, the teeth don't mesh exactly. You can't make them mesh exactly unless you have some very high precision machined helical gears. Um, so uh, spur gears always have this little bit of backlash. And other than decreasing your accuracy, it causes a quite a mess with your control system. Um, as we'll see when we discuss the control system, uh, when it tries to position it into a position, the the if say your encoder sits on this gear and your um, motor sits on this one, then the encoder. Um, I'm not going to rant about that now. I'll rant about that in the control system. But gears are difficult to design a control system for. That's that's all we have to. Uh, no here. Okay, prime mover selection. That's just we already said it's going to be a DC motor. Um, then you can start doing a little bit more detailed design. So start start thinking about how big the tower should be, um, uh, and then start making drawings to yourself about where all the possible forces are going to be on this tower. Um, how heavy is the gun? Start calculating how much the recoil is going to be. So I did some calculations on the recoil, uh, taking into account the barrel length and the the final speed of the bullet and that means that the bullet had to be accelerated for this long um, you know if the barrel is this long the bullet had to reach that speed by that point which means this much of a force had to be applied for 0. Point something something seconds and then it turns out to be that the the gun has to be able to resist a a 
recoil force of about 57 newtons um, for a fraction of a second. All those things, so the torques, uh, oh, and then modal frequency, so just uh, after the structure was sort of finished, designed, before I went into the refinement of the detailed design, I decided what modal frequencies do I want to avoid. So PWM for the motors are going to probably be about 20,000 hertz. There's some other structural resonances I want to avoid. Oh, uh, like the, the person running. We said that they're going to run at, uh, what, a 2 hertz frequency. So we want to try and stay away from any um, modal frequencies in the structure that's going to be close to that. We want to make the modal frequency of the structure much higher than... I'm going into a lot more detail than I intended. These these were intended to be a little short videos. But for example, this modal frequency graph shows that if you're on the resonance frequency, the amplitude of the of the vibrations increase a lot. So if your structure flexes at 4 hertz and the person's running at 4 hertz, you're going to run into trouble more than the guy is. Um, so yeah, keep the modal frequencies high. Motor selection. We talked about motor selection. I use the Como drill um, 540 motor. Things like tensioning the belts now. So think about different ways you can tension, tension the belt. Um, there's a, I thought of a fork tensioner where you could screw it and then it, it sort of pinches the pinions together and wraps the belt around tighter. Uh, you could have two screws on the side to do the same thing and eventually I just decided on the easy route. Fix all the wheels and then just pull the motor down on the uh, on the motor pinion to tension the belt. So here's a more detailed design of the um, lower gearbox. It's a small cutout view of it. And then after the gearbox is designed, now figure out what kind of forces are going to be on the gearbox. So you know what the torque has to be that has to be applied to the pulleys um, to move the gun and that means you can work out that the belt tension should be and since you know those things you can work out all the forces that's gonna, that, that it's going to um, act on the gearboxes and the shafts and the pulleys and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of the calculations of stress and, and um, rigidity I did by hand but things like for the gearbox there's no way I'm going to calculate that so I just I ran a FEM model on uh, Fusion 360 I didn't think it's going to be in tr uh, a trouble, but just made sure that nothing bends completely out of shape. Well, you want to keep the structure as light as possible as well, right? Because you want it to move fast, um, so keep it light. Oh, and then the pulley designs. These are I like I like my pulley designs because a lot of pulleys have the the core, and then they have spokes that go straight up to the to the rim at the edge. But if you think about that, as soon as you twist the core or you twist the outside those spokes are in their maximum bending position. They're just going to be, those spokes are going to bend um, to transfer that force, you know. So why not just put them in tension positions? So you'll see that these pulleys are, um, all the spokes lie tangent to the to the core and then they go to the, um, they go to the outer rim on that tangent. And this means that as soon as it's twisted, most of those spokes are mainly in tension or in compression and not in, in bending. It makes the pulley very, very, very stiff. Um, there's some FEM stuff that I ran on it. Um, choosing belts, I just chose GT2 belts, the easiest to come around, um, and to design the teeth for them on the pulley. There's a lot of formulas for that online that you can do. Wrap the belts around, made sure that they, that they don't slip um, at the required uh, tension ranges that we calculated for the torques. Swivel base. So first I just used a, a lazy Susan bearing, but that thing it wasn't like for the accuracy we were, what we were designing this thing for. It had some places where it just bumped. Um, it wasn't too smooth. So I went and got a very nice deep groove ball bearing nice. that the whole turret swivels on. Okay, then I just figured out how to make the paintball gun's profile a lot smaller and be able to attach a servo to it. I figured out something very nice about this paintball gun that, that has a little latch which I can, instead of using the trigger, I can just pull something back with the servo and it uh, triggers it well. So yeah, paintball gun. Okay, so I'm going to discuss, I'm going to run through my um, my finished mechanical design with this video and I'll provide some commentary as we go just uh, on some design choices and stuff I made. So. 
uh, right off from the before we zoom into it you can see that it stands on a folded stainless steel base where the um, bottom rotating assembly is attached to and the bottom gearbox and then uh, the towers are attached onto that rotating there we go okay you can also see that there's a small black bar on the side that's where the LCD screen uh, sits for the um, microcontroller that's going to be inside that box um, but we'll see that when we do the control system so now we explode the uh, uh, left tower out you'll see that there's basically uh, four pieces of aluminium the outermost one closest to that cylindrical thing over there is sort of redundant uh, the, the towers were strong enough without it there but it only added something like 20 grams to the whole structure and to have that added uh, bulk for bolting stuff to or maybe if I if I measured something wrong or I want to change something then I can just hand drill through that and I don't have to worry that the um, thin aluminium plates will lose the integrity also it looks cool so that cylindrical device is actually the encoder that I chose to use and I think we'll you'll see more of that when I discuss the control system as well so uh, let's zoom in a bit further now you can see the top tower gearbox for the for the tilt drive and you'll see that big pulley in the middle that's where the encoder attaches to so the encoder doesn't attach to the motor directly there's several reasons for that one is the motor spins too fast at its, at its highest rate and the encoder will get saturated so again we'll discuss that in the control system but the encoder uh, can basically only read up to a certain amount of pulses per second and if it's directly on the motor it it comes close to that so for safety margins you put it on the gear also even if it's on the second gear it's not directly on the shaft and it already gets a six-fold increase in accuracy just from putting it on the second gear so mechanically this system reaches a angular accuracy of something like 0 0.001 degrees which is way better than our uh, accuracy design specs state but you have to keep into account that the control system and the tracking system also contribute to those accuracy requirements so the more accurate we could make the mechanical system the less the more room we have to play with with the other things so essentially since this is an order of magnitude and less uh, below our accuracy below accuracy sounds like it's worse accuracy it's better accuracy than than we needed i can essentially leave the mechanical system out of the um load balancing games i have to play against the control system and the tracking system so it's a super accurate mechanical system and then that makes designing the rest a lot easier so you can see the motor for the tilt drive sits on the inside of the tower that's where the handle would have been and that's where the gas pipe would have gone in so it really helped cutting off uh, you know making the profile of the gun a lot smaller it goes through the first plate uh, aluminium plate I think it's a 1.2 mil aluminium plate then the pinion uh, pushes through that plate and the belt wraps around that goes around the tensioner pulleys and then around the big belt then that big belt, uh, that big pulley, is connected to its own pinion on the other side, which has another belt that wraps around the section gear you can see at the top there. And that section gear finally attaches to the shaft of the motor. I'm not going to pull up the specs now, but I think this is a 1 to 36 gearing ratio that we have here. And it's in a very compact space, uh, also extremely light. I think the entire gear box assembly weighed about the same weight as the motor um, okay so here you can see how the um, the gears turn and the the gun can tilt I think 30 degrees down and 20 degrees up and now we can 
actually let's stop here let's just discuss quickly the uh, just some of the frame stuff so you can see that cross bracing in the front uh, of the two towers um, first of all obviously uh, you can imagine that you don't need those uh, the towers are all in these triangular shapes because if you're gonna push and pull on that tower uh, those are going to be the places where all the forces want to travel like the that section everywhere where I cut out sections of the of the material is where no forces essentially would have flown and a good example is in this cross bracing in the front there because like we said that tower is going to start twisting like this right so that cross bracing is going to transfer this pushing force down into the bottom of the of the bottom plate and same for that side so um, and you want to get it as high as possible that's why I started with that curve you want to get it as high as possible to reduce the moment on those points because if you put it down below that lever arm from the from the tower is this long it's a lot of torque uh, it's a it's a big moment but if you raise those arms halfway up it's a lot less uh, uh, the lever arm is not not that great so I kept them as high as possible and without interfering with the gun and there's one little one at the back as well but it had to be a lot smaller because the uh, gas line came out cool so uh, oh, also you can see in the, uh, the gearbox casing there's a whole bunch of holes cut in as well just to reduce weight because that's uh, all places where when I ran the FEM model I saw it was all blue uh, and you can also imagine I mean, you verify it by thinking, oh, well, you know, this is a bolt hole, that is the shaft hole, those two are going to fight each other over forces, so the force will probably flow directly from that point to that point, so keep material there. Uh, but between bolt holes, there's not going to be much forces, so you can just drill that out. Uh, yeah, I think I could have made it a lot lighter, but for 1.2 mil aluminium plate, uh, it's it's not even going to make that much of a difference. The aluminium I used, man, I used to. This was like two years ago. It's T6 something, like aircraft, not the highest super aircraft grade aluminium, not very expensive, but not the cheap brittle stuff which you bend with your hand and it comes apart like confetti okay let's go further bottom gearbox so here's the exploded view again you can see the motor and then the encoder and again the encoder sits on the second gear the one that looks all fancy and uh, this gearbox only has one tensioner the tensioner floated up into the air there but you can see where the belt bends in like that that's where the tensioner is set and uh, both of these if you pull the motor back then it tensions, tensions the belt so that you can see the pinion on this uh, mid gear where it has a belt wrapped around it that goes to the large bottom section gear of the tower so obviously this gear is smaller than the tower gear because we have that massive uh, radius on the section gear at the bottom of the tower um, and this one has the most accuracy I think this one steps down 1 to 56 times and the angular accuracy on the pan side is jeez uh, 0 0.0005 um, just mechanically this is not control system wise or uh, just just if you had to purely take the the angular resolution of the encoder and step it down through the through the gears, I think the encoder had 400 pulses, uh, 400 pulses per no 200 pulses per revolution, and if you quad step it, then you multiply that by four, and then you multiply that by uh, I think the first step up is six. And that means you get something like 2,800 steps uh, in a 70 degree range. Those numbers are rough. I can't, those are roughly the numbers that I remember. So, yeah. Cool. Everything comes back. Uh, 
I thought I'd have much more to say about this. Uh, what can I say? So the Eminem tower ready. So, so